Casey, Frisia Prudence, welcome to the virtual stage with me. Thank you for sharing some time out of your days. I know it's a busy season for all of us. So to dedicate an hour out of your schedule for our community means a lot. So I'm excited to learn from all of you. So let's jump into it right away. And Prudence, I'm going to go to you right, right off the bat. Would you be able to just introduce yourself a little bit, maybe share some of the work that you're doing today, but also maybe jump right into the discussion. Like what does listening look like for you today? What does it mean? What are some of the things you're seeing in this space? I'd love to get your starting perspective on that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. It's good to see everyone. Um, a pleasure to be here with the other uh, panelists and um, excited about this conversation. As Zach mentioned, my name is Prudence Fitter. I've been in the HR space about 27 years, and I head up global HR for the automotive and manufacturing group within Amazon Web Services. Uh, yes, I did say that correctly, and I did make it to this call, which is a mini miracle in itself. Uh, we've had quite the, the week uh, within the, the organization um, here. I'm really excited about this topic because I recognize the importance of listening and also recognizing what to do with the information once we, we receive it. And I've been in organizations in, in throughout my career where we've had a, real, a lot of good data, but when we've had the opportunity to dig in the into the data via one-on-ones and via those smaller focus groups, a lot more has come to light. I truly believe that it's important from an HR perspective, but also from a business perspective to have two-way dialogue. So whenever there's information that's being presented to um, the employee population, getting some additional voices, those individuals that you don't spend as much time with is, is super important. Initially putting right out there, what will be done with the information? When will you share the results? As well as following up with actions. The I heard you, I hear you, I see you is really powerful. And it also helps with building trust and also the engagement, right? The part of where employees want to come back and share more information and ask more, more questions. So those are the thoughts that I, I have just based on my, my experience in, in the HR space and where I've been able to, to make an impact as it relates to employee listening. Thank you, Prudence. Yeah, I'm excited to unpack some of those different levels, right? Of how do we effectively listen? Like, what are the listening strategies? How do we ensure we unlock? voices that maybe are typically unheard or how do we tap into some of those those perspectives and then what do we do with that and the data and then also how do we nurture and create trust and engagement on it so a lot to unpack there i'm excited to get into some of the weeds around those things uh Frisia, i'd love for you to jump in next year yeah share a little bit about yourself and then what does listening start to look like for you or some of the things you're seeing yeah, hello everyone. Uh, excited to be here with uh, our fellow panelists and also really to share about this topic about listening. So I'm Frijia Chan. I'm a VP of uh, people here at Pharma Technologies. Uh, we are a HR tech company and we're also fully remote. So when it comes to listening, it comes with its own challenges on how do you really make sure we hear everybody's voices here in our organization. Uh, about a few years ago, we started with uh, some surveys about some things that we could improve as a company. And a lot of them has to, a lot of survey results showed um, employee really, you know, aren't, you know, really want to be heard. You know, they want to make sure that they are, uh, their voices are being heard and the company are actually, you know, taking actions with some of the feedback they've given. So, you know, obviously as a remote company, it's it has its own challenges. So, you know, we for us, you know, as a for the leadership team as a company as a whole, we recognize that's a really important aspect of building a really engaged culture uh, for our organization. So, um, you know, we start putting strategies and you know a lot of things in place that we could probably dive into later. Uh, but part of what we've done, which we're really proud of, is that listening is actually part of our core values here. So everybody coming in as an employee, as a manager, as part of the interview process they have to really match to this culture that we really believe in. So um, yeah, you know, I think, you know, um, it's definitely a very important um, aspect of building a really engaged culture. And I'm really happy to be here to share some of the, uh, my thoughts today. Thank you, Frisia. Yeah, and I think I, I'm looking forward to maybe talking a little bit, especially with the, the, the remote context as well, right? I think some of the common feedback from employees is always, 
feeling like they're stuck on their own island and they're totally disconnected from the company. They're not really involved with all the things that are happening behind the scenes. So how do we make sure through listening channels and, and dialogue that they do stay connected and feel part of uh, the different movements that are happening within the organization? So yeah, yeah, Terry, you're also fully remote and and yeah, we'll we'll get into that dynamic convo. So Casey, welcome and uh, major shout out to Casey as well. He's coming in from the wee hours of the morning and night. So I uh, appreciate you you taking. Yeah, yeah, it's quite dark out where you are, but yeah, Casey would love to learn more about some of the work you're doing, who you are, and and attuned as well. I know there's some innovative things on the listening front and the the ways that you're doing it. If you don't mind sharing a little bit about what that looks like, but thank you for being here as well. Sure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So I'm Casey. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Attune.ai, uh, the CEO. Uh, so I get the, the pleasure uh, of doing this and being here with all of you and, uh, you know, learning as well. So um, even for myself, like being on a learning journey, you know, I've been in management 15 years, but I'm still trying to get better at listening. Um, you know, and I've gone through that whole loop cycle that unconscious incompetence is probably coming back at, at this point. And, you know, that's kind of what we're trying to do with a, with a tune. So it's deep psychology and AI. And what we can do is show everybody's intrinsic motivation at work. And what we're trying to do is replace carrot and stick management. So it's just such a blunt tool. Um, We've all probably used it and too many of the managers in our organizations use it. And we're trying to help our customers do that. And I, I think some of the you know, conversations that come up kind of touch with what we do with, with our customers and like, how do you close that feedback loop? So especially if you're getting feedback at scale through surveys, you know, you get the data type of thing, but usually the people providing it are, okay, what's being done? Or am I even being listened to? And then there gets to be survey fatigue. So that closing loop is very important. I think Prudence raised that. And how do you change behavior? behavior. Like if you're at that micro scale, like how can you change an individual manager's behavior? And like to build trust, you've got to listen, you've got to understand, make people feel understood, you know? So the difference between the micro kind of one-on-one -on -one and the at scale and what you do at both sides of these equations to, to build the listening, I, I think it's quite complex and, and difficult. So hopefully I can come away with a, a couple of things as well as provide a, a couple through the, the next 45 minutes or so. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, yeah, I'll learn with all of you. This is obviously more complex of a subject than maybe we like to think or else maybe we wouldn't be discussing it still. And and I always like to think myself as a, a leader, I'm a, a good listener, right? But there's so many things that go into filtering what we actually hear, uh, creating the space where the employee or the other individual has the trust to actually speak their perspective in a, a transparent way. And then yeah, how do we close the loop by taking action and showing that we're listening and then maintaining that trust. So maybe throughout this conversation, we kind of, we can work through this loop a little bit. Uh, starting with, I'd love for the group we to break down a little bit, uh, harnessing some of that real-time feedback and how do we actually start to leverage listening strategies to gather this information and uh, Prudence, I'll go back to you and we'll just kind of keep it open and go around the horn here a little bit. But uh, when we talked uh, in the past, you shared different strategies for ongoing communication and listening strategies, and there's different mechanisms to do this. Mm -hmm. From your experience, what does that look like? Like, what are some of the ways that companies and our listeners can consider unlocking like the listening strategy? Like, and, and what does that look like in real time? Yeah, there are two things I'd love to piggyback on that Casey said before I answer that, if that's okay, Zach. One is around the individual listening and listening at, at scale, right? And, and recognizing the emotional intelligence that comes with listening in those two audiences, if you, you will. And the other is the individual managers, right? And I, I'm probably going to paraphrase you wrong, Casey, but something along the lines of those managers having the, the tools and being equipped to have those listening sessions. And I heard an example actually earlier today of a leader opening up a meeting. One of their employees came on and said, I just got engaged. Total silence. And then the leader said, so today's agenda and if I didn't trust the other individual, I would have said that's truly a lie. There's no way that that happened. 
but there's definitely an opportunity there, right? For em emotional intelligence and having leaders lead because they're ready to lead, not because they've been successful at the job they were in um, previous, previously. So there are two parts of that, being able to have the opportunity to know when the conversation needs to shift. And we saw this during COVID, right? I, I heard of leaders who joined those Zoom calls after having the opportunity of being in person for a very long time and recognizing the energy was off, right? And and, and pausing to do, do check-ins and cancel meetings when they need to and, and have more one-on-ones and, um, and things like this. There is an element of employee well-being, which is a topic I'm super passionate about. When it comes to listening, there's also a cultural aspect as well and a recognition that we all do not show up to the to work in the same, even if we wear uniforms, right? And we're wearing the same uniforms, even if we're the same race, even if we're the same gender, we all have different experiences. So leaders have a duty to pause and recognize that it's important that if you have this privilege of lead, leading, it's important to get to know the individuals so that when you're listening, like if I'm a big talker and I get to this meeting and there's a question for me and I say, okay, recognizing that, well, Prudence usually drops two to three sentences. She just gave us one word. Let me do a check-in with her or recognizing the individuals who don't normally speak up but clearly they're smart enough. They, they deserve to be in the organization, finding a way to get information from them. So I think flexibility, emotional intelligence, recognizing cultural differences. Um, and I'll pause there because I, I, I saw um, Frisia nodding and, and Casey as well. So I'm sure they have some points to add. Yeah, Frisia, Casey, feel free to jump in. But I think some of the things I'm hearing here is like, yes, there's kind of, systemic ways that as an organization you can listen but then there's actual more just real time in the moment listening uh like experiences and there's almost these indicators and these like these triggers and moments that employees are providing you where you just need to have some like presence and awareness of like oh that's actually a signal of something that i need to be attuned to 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 maybe follow up on or feedback on or ask more questions about but if you're not like you said have that emotional intelligence or that that presence in the moment you're not able to kind of listen to those micro moments that come into play through yeah maybe a check-in or yeah someone was short and and having to be like oh you know something's going on with prudence maybe before we go into the strategy for the agenda i should probably check in on something here and listen to that yeah, I think it's fantastic. And I thought Prudence's like story was was wonderful and, and cringe. Uh, you know, certainly the cringe at it. But like th this is where I get interested in like the follow up questions. Like uh, what we've experienced and what I've experienced. You know, I've experienced that scale with with our customers and also is most managers. You know, they don't have bad intents. Mo most people really don't have bad intents. So what was going on with that person who opened up that meeting? You know, are they a new manager? And like when you're a new manager, maybe a bit nervous and you you script it out. This is the meeting. You want to have an effective meeting. Here's the agenda. Here's what we're going to talk about. And you had that like as a framework stuck in your head and that manager couldn't get out of it. Or is it something totally different? Like, you know, if I look at the intrinsic motivation lens through a tune is social relationships is, is one of the intrinsic motivators we identify. And some people are, that's why they come to work. I want to strengthen my intrinsic motivation. And this is where humanity starts to get messy and complex is other people like, I don't need that social relationship. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm not generous. It doesn't mean I'm not kind, but I've got plenty of stuff going on at home that I'm going to work to get work done and get away from some of that maybe type of thing like that. So is the manager low social relationships and Mm, they're a little bit awkward don't know what to do when somebody brings you know uh you know personal into that so and then how do you do that at scale and like how do you get all of these managers so as prudence was talking about is like the flexibility to understand to be aware and okay here's what i'm receiving from the the corporation, this is what I need to do to get my KPIs. This is what I need to do to get stuff done. And I feel all this pressure all the time, but then I have to have kind of the the 
emotional flexibility and capacity to be able to pick on what's going. So, you know, where we're at is we're trying to champion managers, like they're stuck in the middle and they, they really need help. And uh, I think this is what it is. And whether it's, you know, at the large scale side of things where you can do the surveys and how do you effectively work on those surveys and let people know that you're working on those surveys or are you doing it kind of more individually and one-on-one -on -one? so i think those are the two methods can you do at scale with surveys to get kind of the big data to see okay here are the couple of things that we need to do for the organization at scale or that one-on-one -on -one. and that one-on-one -on -one piece is absolutely critical if you want to build that trust and and kind of keep people engaged and understand their motivations and stop them from leaving as well yeah, I would agree. You know, I think there are definitely multiple, multiple layers when it comes to listening, right? There's the manager one-on-ones, which Prudence, I love that example, by the way. And, you know, some of them, you know, I think most of managers, you know, they are kind of stuck in the middle, you know, when they have one-on-one -on -one meeting, it's all about task management, about project management. You know, there are times we just forget to ask, how are you, right? What's, how are you today? How are things going, right? So, you know, like part of what we do here in our organization is we, you know, give a manager a recommended agenda <laughs> when you have your one-on-ones and, you know, ask them to a, at least insert, you know, you know, part of your conversation to check in to see the well-being of the employees. Um, you know, that would kind of help them get, go through the conversation too. So, you know, I think it's very important to build for employees and manager to build that trusting relationship so employee can open up and the manager learn how to truly listen to the manager and actually listen beyond, you know, what they're saying as well. Um, and, you know, like, you know, Casey said, right, there's going to be a large scale on surveys, you know, like really getting the really uh, uh, the macro data within organization, how employees feel. Um, really like on a, a, a different uh, on different you know, different scale but one thing that we've done as well is we have multiple channels for employees to voice their opinions beyond the survey beyond the one-on-ones um you know we have like two more you know links and portals people can like submit their like feedback anytime they want right and those are anonymous those are really, you know, really safe for employees to voice their opinions. So there are different ways um, for employees to really, really speak their mind if they want to. Um, and also what I found really interesting too is um, part of our um, employee, you know, performance check-in too, we do have um, our employee have a written portion before they, you know, and then manager have the written portion before they, um, before they uh, they meet in person to do their perform performance check-in. So interestingly enough, we had a, a situation where manager thought everything was fine, you know, with employees, they have to check in, they have their one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, regularly, but employee wasn't comfortable, I think, voicing their sort of concerns, but when they get the chance to actually write it out, they were able to do that. And that really bridged the gap between the manager and the employee to really have that meaningful conversation about, you know, whatever, situ whatever situation is going on with the employee. So I think, I don't think there's a one really strategy or playbook that fits all, but I think it's really giving, having the multiple avenues and channels for employees to reach out if they feel free, feel safe to do so. Frisia, I love what you said about recommended agenda. Right, because there's some there's some cultures where my manager expects this of me and said this of me, and even though I'm a manager, I'm going to follow kind of the script. So I love the intentionality about a recommended agenda, right, and and asking those questions, which makes me think about in in the space that I work in, I encourage leaders to do check-ins, and particularly around well-being check-ins. While I encourage leaders to speak last when they're gathering information in a group setting, in a setting where things are new, I encourage them to speak first, right? So if you're asking employees the ways they're prioritizing their well-being, start with your example, normalize it. Because someone said in the chat, right, it's about top down. So when you're sharing, I am an employee of the organization too, these things that I'm championing are important to me as well. And this is how I'm prioritizing myself. This is how I'm prioritizing the work. This is how I get good work done. That helps to normalize the, the conversation. Because to your point, Casey, people have good intentions, right? And, and it doesn't always, a good intention on getting the work done 
could mean that you're negatively impacting um, someone's someone's well-being and that you're just not listening, right? To the obvious excitement of I just got engaged or to the unspoken word of, you know, my camera is is off and it normally is on, or I'm on camera and I, I have um, a grumpy look, if you, if you will. And so I agree with you, uh, Frija, that there, there are multiple ways and it really ties back to a leader who's really in tune to the person and recognizing the importance of leadership and that a huge part of that is getting to know individuals and asking the right questions. And it makes me think about as well, when you do get to the point as an HR department or, you know, leadership team, where you are implementing a listening strategy at scale, even though you're, you're putting together all these different methods or channels, I, you're probably going to come up against a barrier of getting those things to actually be impactful if your leaders are not effective in their own individual listening interactions, right? Like if the, if the employee is already having some concerns that they're not being heard from their leader, that's going to roll up to the larger strategies of going, well, obviously my leader doesn't care about listening. So why the rest of the organization probably not going to do anything with this anyway. So it's, is you kind of, you need both to kind of support each other. And I'm assuming if one's working, if the leadership one's working really well, it'll amplify your other listening strategies but if the leader is not working well from a from being a listening you know advocate for that, uh, it's gonna ne- it's like amplified it in a negative way as well. So there's kind of a reinforcement loop that's happening there between these two. Um, and then Josephine, I think I saw like I love the the comment of having a training of listening for gold, like a leadership training around that. And I think that's like such a like a way to maybe put it is like, hey, this is not only obviously what we want to prioritize as a as a leadership ethos and and behavior but it's also a way to help you actually achieve those kpis and those tasks and the things that you're doing these insights are gold to you being elevated as a leader as well so there are you know strategic reasons for that for the leader to engage in this behavior um i'm curious as as we think about scaling listening uh, across the organization and, and Frisia, I know you've talked a little bit about this, especially within remote teams. Can you share maybe just like some of the main methods that we can do this? Obviously, we have our annual engagement surveys, and then we have potentially poll surveys. And then it sounds like, Frisia, you also mentioned there's other channels that where people can proactively jump into and provide their feedback. And, and this is also open to the floor. Are there other channels or methods that you're like, this is stuff that every HR department or organization should be considering with their listening strategy? Well, um, I would say, unfortunately, for the for a remote organization, like survey is probably the most common tool we get to use just because we you know, don't really have that one on one interactions. But I think, you know, having a small group discussions, you know, within a listening group, that's always going to be very effective. Some of our um, departments, you know, within their group, you know, they have, they meet with their leader within their organization, the, the, the VP of their organization, having a ask me anything sessions once a month, right? And I think that's very effective because some people, you know, some employees doesn't want to share like their personal, like their, their, their not personal, but their, 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 their opinions, you know, out in public. So having, creating a safe space for them to um, share their feedback to their leader within the group. I think that gets really effective too, because, you know, within our leadership team, we have, you know, we practice listening among ourselves and we get the results from each individual leaders. And that sometimes we synthesize those results together and really come up with a strategy, what works for the company. Um, So I think having those intentional listening group moments, either within a team, within a larger organization, that always really, um, it's really helpful. And also I think um, from a leader standship, uh, leadership standpoint is the leaders has to be like exactly like you said, they have to set an example, like leading by example that they are listening to employees, right? So, you know, we do have, you know, most company have this uh, month, once a month, all hands on meeting. And we will bring up the, the, the concern that we are hearing anonymous, anonymously and address them, you know, in public forum. Right. This is what we're hearing, and this is what we're doing to address some of the issues. And here are some stuff that we cannot act on just yet, 
but it is going to be on top of our mind, you know, and we'll keep you guys updated. So I think really um, coming from leadership, um, the, the leadership voices is going to be really important to that building that trust between employee and leaders within an organization and with, you know, in a large organization as well. The frequency of gathering feedback is also important to normalize it and, and have it become a part of the, the culture. In our organization, every morning we open up our, our laptop, we're asked one or two um, check-in questions and, and those rotate. It could be, how satisfied are you with your, your job right now? How satisfied are you with your manager? When you think about our leadership principles, what are some of the leadership principles that are strengths? for your team, what are some that are, are opportunities. And at the end of each month, each manager receives a report. So you're clearly able to see the areas where there are opportunities and the areas where, where there are strengths. And leaders tend to go to the opportunities first. What's the action plan and, and how can we, we dive in? And we have a lot of data to give us to give us ideas on action in those. But I like to pause on where we have that green, right? Where we're doing really well. What are we doing well and how do we preserve that so that we don't focus too much on what we're not doing well and then start to have more um, things that, that start to, to slip. So in addition to listening, it's important to pause and celebrate, right? When we're getting good feedback and we're getting things about the organization and about the culture that's going right, it's important to pause and, and celebrate those and learn more about those to keep those strong. And then of course, make sure that we understand why some areas are a struggle for us and how to go about making sure that we, we start to, to address those. So making a, a product that kind of does some of the stuff that you, you mentioned, Prudence, I can back up with product data about user data is like, we one of the, the dashboards we have is uh, motivation satisfaction. So it's like a, a two week kind of pulse survey, checking on in every individual specific motivators, whether they're being satisfied. And like when a manager logs in, they look at, okay, what are the opportunities? You know, 90% of users look right at opportunities. What do I need to do to, to get better, right? And it's always about more and more and more. Very few actually look like, hey, this is going great, you know, and very few kind of celebrated. So I think going back to listening, like, yeah, I think you just got a huge tech box is, you know, celebrating this is what we're doing and celebrating what is being said and reiterating. I think Zach's done it a couple of times, like reiterating what other people have said very well and saying their own words, you know, their own concepts back to them in, in different ways. And what Frisha has mentioned with kind of the different channels, I, I think has been fantastic is, you know, whether you're having like a, a scripted for the managers, you know, how to go about running your meetings, a recommended script or, or recommended agenda, I think you said, or, you know, giving the writing channel and it's not just a speaking channel. So you have different ways of expressing yourself is also very important. And, and you, you know, if we kind of walk away, I think what we need to do is like, not only do it at scale and get the, the macro data, but how do we help our managers and how do we help our leaders change their behavior? And I think this is, is quite the difficult part. And if we're doing it like by training, or if there's one thing we say, because you have to tell managers just do this it's how are you you know like you, i think you said it earlier freezer is how are you and that's it sometimes you know if that's what you're doing for the well-being checking in if you actually say it with intention and try to listen and try to understand there was one time back when i was you know an individual contributor i had a manager say that to me and he said it in, in kind of quite a caring way. It felt like he cared about me. And I almost started crying, you know, at that time. And uh, it, it just those words, I think, uh, can have like a, a powerful intention. And, you know, just also one of the things we've been developing here recently at Attune, and I think this goes good for remote, we're also remote first, is with technology, you have another way to start changing behavior. So what we can do is we can record the one-on-one -on -one calls and you can give that immediate email back to the manager five minutes later, say, hey, Casey, you didn't do a very good job listening. Here was the listening time versus your speaking time. You had zero follow-up questions type of thing like that. You didn't do a well-being check-in. And I think this to change behaviors across our managers is really hard to get them to listen. So we can go out and we, we can preach, but how many people actually, when they're busy, and they're jumping from meeting to meeting to meeting and they just feel they need to get stuff done, how well can they listen? But if you have something like this that can give that fast feedback cycle to change behavior, you know, it is something quite useful as well. And one of the advantages of, of being remote. 
Casey, yeah. I love that. I love the idea of the notes and that self-inspection. I, I did a talk in Canada a few months ago, and they tell you not to watch the video, but I did. And as I was watching it back, I was like, oh, it wasn't Tuesday, it was Thursday. Like I was beating myself up on the smallest thing. No one in the audience knew, right? But the pressure was on. I was on stage. There's probably 150 people in, in the audience. The ticker is, 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 is going. And so I shared information that was inaccurate. Thankfully, not to the detriment of the talk. It didn't take away from what I, I was talking about. But when the pressure is on, if it's performance management or it's a difficult conversation, there, you could focus on the wrong things or you could say the wrong things unintentionally and having that, I'd call it spotlight, right? That feedback after to inspect and recognize areas. I can't go back and fix my talk, right? That's done. They now think it's Thursday and it was Tuesday. That's even if they heard me, right? But in a leadership relationship to recognize that, oh no, I, I said Tuesday and it was Thursday or, or vice versa. I need to go back and say, hey, just to check in on our on our one-on-one -on -one. this is what i shared this is what I, I i meant let's follow up if you have any concerns with that i think that's absolutely huge because especially in those times when the pressure is is on you could get off a, a meeting and say Ooh, did I just say love you to the team? I, I didn't normally say that, right? When everyone is, or you're saying thanks, you too, and it's inappropriate. No, hopefully never in a really inappropriate way, but there's so many examples of us having the opportunity or needing the opportunity to inspect and then go back and correct. That is huge. And I've seen and I, I think times. Oh, go ahead, Casey. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I, I think like if you're kind of touching on the key point, like the, one of the key points of learning and training, they tell you, you know, if you have those big executive training type of things is that you need that time for reflection. And, and how can you do that? And most of us don't take that time or we don't have that time. So I think if you can't create that is can you have tools that help your leaders have a space for reflection or prompting them to reflect is is key. And some of the things I, I've just been seeing in the chat, and I think what you're really helping reaffirm and is the question of like, how do we how do we reaffirm more leadership accountability around these things as well, right? Like obviously we want to prioritize these type of behaviors and get leaders to role model the way, but how do we actually ensure they're doing it, right? Like how do we drive accountability around those who are leaders and you know, support their own feedback or performance review or or processes into how they're behaving with their team. And Casey, I think that was such a great example of, well, do we have data and true feedback and the ability to spotlight their behaviors and and having maybe, yeah, recordings of their, their meetings that actually take in the data, they're talking versus listening time and follow-up questions and some of these things. Uh, that's going to be really crucial in the helping drive that accountability. Um, so I, I think that was, that was such a great example. And one other thing I wanted to build off of was, you know, what do we do with the data, which I'd love to kind of convert into that conversation here now is like, okay, if we are listening and we do conduct these different types of listening sessions, either one-on-one -on -one from a leadership standpoint or at scale, what do we do with the information? One of the things you talked about was how important it is to spotlight the strengths, the celebrations and some of those things, because it's easy to get kind of suckered into that like doomsday hole of let's just look at the challenges and all the things that are wrong. Uh, it can make everything feel like actually nothing's going well here, right? Like everything's going wrong and you can kind of get stuck in that that paradigm a little bit where we know from a well-being standpoint, one of the biggest things is do we feel a sense of momentum or forward progress or things that are going well that's so important for our well-being if we're not listening and recognizing and celebrating those things people are always going to be kind of in this, well, I'm just not doing anything right. There just continues to be problems and there always will be. There's always things to work on, right? So um, I think from a well-being standpoint, I just wanted to reaffirm that. But yeah, I would love to get your perspectives now on kind of the action piece. And, you know, Prudence, you've talked about how important it is to, you know, one, identify like who is collecting this data and who's in charge or leading the the gathering and you know, the, the uncovering of the insights, like that process. So I'd love your perspective on that. And then as a group, maybe we can talk into the leadership side thing as well. Cause I think one of the biggest barriers, maybe why leaders 
fear listening is, well, well, but if I listen and I hear something, I don't know what to do with it, right? Like, well, if I hear it's not the anniversary and they share they just got a divorce and how am I supposed to respond to that, right? Like, so we'll get into that piece, but maybe like the data gathering piece, Prudence, I know you talked about how that is. Can you share a little bit of, yeah, the strategy and the intention behind that part? Sure. So throughout my career, HR has owned the employee listening, gathering the data, crafting the message, sharing what was learned, as well as the, the action plan. Uh, in my current organization, it's a partnership. It's HR and the leaders. So those monthly reports go to both the, the HR uh, leader as well as the leader of the business unit at the same time. So we are both getting the information at the same time. And then we are able to, to pause in, in meetings that we have that run um, for some organizations, depending on the size, it's quarterly. For some, it's, it's monthly, but the data is available monthly and take a look at trends and opportunities for, for celebration. And, and opportunities for, for improvement. The data itself tells part of the story is what I uh, found. And so having regular conversations, yes, the employees have the pop-up. Many times they answer with the intent to get to what they were doing on their screen, more so than answering thoughtfully. So a lot of the follow-up that we have with employees individually and in groups are more telling about what, what's happening in the organization. For example, how is the question interpreted? And when you think about organization, are they thinking of the company as a whole or are they thinking about their, their business unit? And when they think about job satisfaction, is it a matter of is there an opportunity for career growth or it, do they feel that they're in the right job but not being satisfied in the job because of name, um, name the reason, right? So the data gathering is important because it's nice to see the metrics. It's nice to kind of see how many employees answered, how many didn't. I believe that's a huge telling point, right? So if you, you have a population of 700 and, and you have 300 employees who are responding to the survey regularly, you have 400 who are constantly clicking, I have no information to share. Those are the ones I really want to, to hear from. And, and so sharing what I'm hearing as far as from the other 300 with all of employees is important because it's interesting some of the the data points that you get though you can't tell who took the, the the survey and who didn't but sharing with everyone the output hopefully in, improves the the numbers um so for for our organizations it's a matter of ownership between hr and the business and, and having that true partnership and and that transparency and then sharing it with the employee population and asking additional questions to make sure that we can change kind of on the ground, if you will, even if we can't impact the organization as a whole. I think one thing that was kind of powerful about that partnership strategy and, and Jaya, you kind of reaffirmed what I was thinking, same thing in the chat here is when you make it a partnership and there's other stakeholders involved into the, the practice, the ritual, it creates shared accountability as well, right? So this isn't just HR's thing. HR isn't the one just doing the listening. This is also leadership's responsibility as well. And they have to report on it on a monthly basis. And it's part of their their own ritual and their own routine as being a leader. And so it, it's, it's kind of interesting where you could probably get to some of those monthly meetings. And if they got nothing to report, it's like, wait, you, have you been listening? Like, where is the insights that we're gathering? There's There's a responsibility here. So- um, I, I love that it's more of a partnership versus, you know, HR often gets sucked into being just, you know, that's their job. It's only that that's them that's doing this. Right. Um, and, and Casey, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the data gathering piece, what to do with the insights. How does it, you know, convert to like, what does action look like afterwards? And it sounds like you're in many ways is, is kind of automating that. So making it easier to actually do, but can you talk a little bit about that side of things once we get to, you know, we've done the listening, we've done the set survey, or, or what do we do now? Where, where does that, how does action play a role here? That is the big question that managers are looking for. Like, okay, I can see this isn't going well. And that's where their eyes go away, you know, from a user and say, this is what's not going well on my team. What do I do? 
And that's kind of the first question to do. So like as a system, we can systematically do it and we give them the action within that. So here's what's not going well. Based on what's not going well, this is what you do. And you have to do it like create the action very, very small. So it's something that they can do that day or the next meeting. It can't be a seven step action or a 10 step action type of thing. Like ultimately to change a culture, to change a team, make it more psychologically safe, to increase trust, those type of things are multi-step to be able to do it, but to change the action, you have to, to do it. And I, I think kind of the, the key point is, okay, you have the data and I, I love that it's a partnership for HR. And, you know, when we work with our, our customers, when it's just HR running this, it's, it's tough, you know, it's, it's thankless, it's, they can't get it right. You know, managers and leaders are the one implementing every single day. And that's the experience if the the team members and the employees like do i like my manager or not okay not very nice to me that's why i leave that's why i disengage and that's why you know i get sick on mondays or you know i'm kind of dialing it in type of thing like that so it's how do we change that so that partnership is absolutely critical but getting that data is showing that feedback loop is like how do you say okay i've received the data and i'm actually actually or just saying that i heard it so coming up with like templates. So we do this within the system. So all the comments come back anonymously. And as a manager, you can see the comments on your team, but you can respond to that comment and you don't know exactly who it is. So the system knows who the anonymous comment is. So they're a little bit more open to do it. You can say, oh, this is a great idea. Thank you so much for sharing. You don't know who it was, if it was, uh, you know, John or Carol or whatever that shared it, but it goes back to them. Or, you know, saying, okay, this is what's not going well with the team and here's the data and sharing that data open. I think like transparency, you know, where some of the comments up at the top that people were looking for is like, okay, these are some of the problems, you know, and I think Prudence mentioned it before is when you're saying something new is you need to be vulnerable. So as a manager, okay, these are what's not really going well with the team. I'm, I need to champion what's going great and celebrate that, but here's where it's open and ask for ideas. So say, hey, we're not doing a great about x what do you think and just stopping and being quiet and letting it go and that helps the feedback loop oh okay actually looking at the data trying to get some insight and it also brings them into it so they're kind of the team becomes part of the solution as well and they're engaged and it's not just the burden uh, on you as a leader i love that like let's delegate almost like what to do to we're actually listening to as well right like we don't actually need to be the solvers of all the the problems or the feedback that come in, we could also be the listeners in the solution. So it's also the follow up asking, you know, the the question back to your your employees or your direct team and saying, okay, I'm I'm hearing you. Let's talk through that. How do we navigate this? Because I think that's maybe where the pressure comes for leaders is I'm supposed to have all these answers. I'm supposed to know everything. I, I'm supposed to be the expert on all this and. So how do we alleviate that pressure from our leaders and be like, look, you don't need to know all the answers. You just need to be able to maybe craft a solution with them in a more creative way. Um, so I love that, that kind of partnership as well. And I like what Frisha said earlier, like to go back about two channels. So you could do this in a meeting and ask, but then you're probably going to have some people who like to speak up and there you're going to have a couple of people who are very, you know, thoughtful and intelligent, but unless you're running a great meeting, sometimes it's hard to get that out. So if you have that other channel of a written, we can have this spoken, we can have this written, we can have both channels, you're going to get a richer idea uh, of doing that. And it's easier for you, right? It takes more burden off you. Uh, yeah. And I think that's what we need to do for our leaders as well. Yeah, and I think like a, a, a common perspective I've been, you know, reaffirming in a lot of our programs this year for HR leaders is how do you turn change your your mindset of your role from being an execution like leader to an enablement hub, right? Like it's more of how do you enable other people to lead these things and execute them versus always be the ones to lead it. So uh, Frisia, I'd love you to jump in here. Yeah, and um, I love what Casey said earlier too. It's really, you know, and I think Prudence said this as well. It's like the leaders have to show they're being vulnerable. Like the that's such an important aspect of building trust within organizations. You know, if everything's going great all the time or everything's going not so great all the time, right? It's, it's, it, it, you're not giving a really true perspective what's going on. So, you know, if you we, if celebrate a great feedback we receive from the employees and also, you know, if something's not going well, be transparent and honest about it. Like, I think people actually appreciate that more than anything else. And at the end of the day, I think all employees 
uh, understand there might not be a perfect solution for everybody or for the organization or for, you know, who, you know, my coworkers, right? There's not going to be a perfect solution. But, you know, having taken that small actions, one small step, it's going to be so meaningful for those people who spoke up, right? You know, if, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I want to be able to shift my schedule for a little bit, you know, to have more flex schedule, you know, the manager say, you know, maybe I cannot do that for every day, but let's work on the time. What works for you? Having that collaboration with the employees is so important, getting our feedback. And also ask follow-up questions, like you said, right? Be curious, you know, open the floor for them to like kind of talk more about what they're, you know, the, the issue that they want to address. Um, and also for us, I think earlier we talked about like the survey too, right? So what we do with our our surveys <laughs> is they're, you know, they're they're very they're very short, you know. Under question survey is too big, too much action item. It's really daunting. You're not getting all the results or the participation that you probably would like to have. But so what we do with our survey is we have um, we focus different areas every every six months. So you know, for example, we did psychological safety um, and um, communication like early this year. Um, later on this year, we're gonna focus on different areas of where we seeing seeing more um, more um, sort of what well, we're hearing from managers, what they're kind of working with within, within an organization. So really chopping down that survey to a mini survey and focus on, focus on different areas has, we've been seeing a great result with that. Yeah, I like that. How it's like, how do we be strategic with the listening versus let's just spray out a bunch of questions and we're just going to get a ton of data and then we get all these insights and now we're overwhelmed with all these different things that you know, what do we do with this? How do we take action? So I, I I like that, you know, really focused approach to your listening strategy around, you know, this is something that we want to solve and we know it's going to impact engagement. It's going to impact performance. Let's really dial into that. And then we're going to be able to take small actions around that, or at least acknowledge some of the things that we're looking to do in response to that. So that's wonderful. Uh, so we're, we're coming up on the last couple of minutes here. So I would love maybe just to go around the horn here and start to just add some closing thoughts. And I'd be curious too, if, especially on, you know, the, the role of the leader, obviously huge theme of this conversation and, and key element to our listening strategies at scale being successful, as well as as a culture, as an organization, that being a, a part of your employee experience. So maybe just some closing thoughts on that. I think that's a huge challenge for a lot of the people, you know, in the chat here sharing, like, how do we hold accountability to that? How do we encourage leaders to start developing that safety where people are able to voice their their perspectives? Um, how do you work this into the rituals or routines or partnerships? And so I'd just be curious of any closing thoughts on maybe this side of things, uh, leadership, you know, accountability, building trust and, and things like that for, for all of our listeners here. If there's certain tips or strategies, you know, tactical things that maybe our audience could could take action on from this discussion. So Big question, hard to answer, probably one of the most challenging parts of all of this. So <laughs> no pressure or anything. But uh yeah, I would love to I'd love to maybe close out with that and and prudence. I'm gonna go to you because you've been kicking off all our our main big questions here. Yeah, so I would say definitely uh be repetitive. At first, your efforts won't necessarily um, pay off, right? Get leadership buy-in and be repetitive. So in the big and end, the results might be minimal, but continuing to celebrate those wins, being transparent with the messages and the themes that are coming through from employees so that those that are kind of stragglers, if you will, will, will start to, to share information. And then that transparency. Transparency is huge. Encourage transparency from the business, certainly be transparent transparent um, from an HR perspective. And even if you're transparent messages that you don't have a lot to share right now, but being vulnerable and, and sharing that will absolutely help with getting more employees to feel engaged within the organization. And also those employees who are not necessarily as participative, they will get to, they'll start to participate because they'll see that you're, you're taking feedback seriously, you're sharing it, and that you're also celebrating wins. That's great. <clears throat> and yeah, I think it's like, how do you look at this as we're in this for the long game, we're going to be listening, right? It's not, 
all right, let's do this one survey and then see what happens after that. It's it's that repetitive long game that you're entering into. So that's uh, thank you, Prudence, for for that. Uh, Frisia, why don't, why don't you jump in next here? Yeah, I agree with everything that Prudence says. Like it's you know it's, it's really be repetitive. I think that's important. You know, don't be discouraged from the first or second or the third survey that you receive um, the feedback you have because um, you know. It takes time to build culture. It takes time to slowly change the way we operate. Um, you know, we operate as a management team, right? So don't be discouraged and really keep going with the effort because once you are shown results, taking that small steps, taking that small actions, you build that psychological safety and trust with their employees. Then you will receive more feedback where I always celebrate if I receive you know, not so good feedback, I'm like, yay, they're really, really, really trusting and be vulnerable to share that feedback with us. It, I take that as a win as well. So I think it's really how you, you know, how you view, view those um, comments you receive from employees and really, um, you know, knowing that there's, you can always be better. We can always be better as an organization. There is no perfect listening strategy. So we just have to take it day by day and really putting efforts. And I think that really will show in, in your engagement and your survey data and your culture as well. Thank you, thank you. All right, Casey, bring us home. Oh, the pressure. Uh, so I think on the theme of like delegation and enablement and being like partners with our, our leaders from HR is, I would recommend to measure psychological safety. So it goes back to that accountability. So what you measure gets done. If there's a number, here's your team psychological safety and basically psychological safety is the trust every member has towards their team. So it's a team-based kind of concepts and psychological data. So every team is gonna have different psychological safety. So if you had like a heat map all over the organization, some are gonna be high, some are gonna be kind of low, but and you can share that relatively if you're open to sharing that and managers will be accountable. And I think if you get managers, oh, I'm not doing great. I need to kind of move on the psychological safety and psychological safety, transparency, vulnerability, listening. These are all kind of sub components that add up to this overall score. So if you get that score, then you're going to have that accountability to kind of nudge the managers to, to do it. And it's going to improve it. You're going to the outcomes are going to be better trust, better transparency. So that would be my recommendation. And uh, yeah, we can do that for you. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much to the three of you for, for taking time. Thank you, Zach. This was amazing. Uh, that's We're wrapping it up. I appreciate everyone hanging out two minutes after. Yeah, could we give like a virtual appreciation? I love that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, definitely got attuned and some of the work they're doing. We're going to share some information on that. You can check out their guide in the chat. Otherwise, everyone have a great rest of your afternoons. This wraps us up and, and thanks for joining our live discussion.